welcome to the NBA Coast to Coast podcast brought to you by thelines.com. Coming to you from the West Coast, Josh Lander, joined by Nate Weitzer. He's on the East Coast, and we've got a Thursday slate of hoops here for you guys with some interesting games for sure. I will say we're going to be running through best bets in this one. We've also got a play a props video up for you as we do each and every weekday. So go ahead and like and subscribe to that page. Continue to follow along with us all season and through the playoffs and into the championships. We're here for it all. Uh, also want you to head to the lines.com use everything we have up on the site right now and uh, including that odds finder tool that we use each and every day to make sure that we're getting the best juice back on all of these bets that we're making in the NBA this season. Nate, let's go ahead and get into your first NBA best bet here. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to get Josh to take this last night. Uh, we recorded kind of early, so we didn't have the full picture of how the Warriors might look, um, but yeah, I mean, Warriors to score a bunch of points, that game to go over with the Hawks, didn't quite get into the video, but I'll try to catch the boat here, even if it's maybe a little late, but it's not a normal back-to-back for the Warriors here. They're plus two at home against a Kings team that's bad on the road, They're just straight up bad recently, um, and so I will take the dubs here. I, I mean, money line plus 105, plus two on the spread either way. I mean, they had eight days rest before yesterday. It was an emotional win. Yes, it will be a bit of a letdown now emotionally. Um, for, but from a basketball standpoint, like this is a team you want to back now. That's a team that's clawing back into the playoff picture, finally has Draymond back and had a full week of practice to integrate Draymond. And you probably saw, I mean, he came off the bench after they looked pretty bad in his first game back, which we had no practice leading up to it. Then they get a whole week, right, Josh? I mean, I can just picture if you're a beat writer, if you're a fly on the wall and be like, Draymond doing really well with the second unit in practice, like inspiring competition and, and getting everybody back to that state that they, they, the championship state they were in. And then they just continue with that by bringing him off the bench at the second unit. And they just blow the doors off a, a shorthanded Hawks team. Granted, but I mean, back to backs are not necessarily the problem for the dubs, right? I mean, they've actually won three straight back to backs, including the last two, which were home and home. Uh, they're five and two on the season in this situation. Steph has been lights out on back to backs, actually, higher usage, more points per game. So, we going to look at him in player props. You can same game parlay him here uh, against the Kings team that he has torched, of course. They were 10-1 and one against the Kings prior to uh, a loss in November in the regular season. They kind of fell apart in the second half there, but you should be encouraged by what the job Draymond did on DeMontis Sabonis, like holding him to like nine points and dubs out rebounding the Kings. And recently, yeah, I said the Kings have been flat out bad. The biggest stat here is in their last eight overall, they have the worst three-point defense in the league. And now you go into Golden State against a revitalized, rested team, team that's showcasing depth now to a degree now that Wiggins has woken from his coma and Draymond is back from his suspension. And we're talking about Kings team that doesn't have a quality road win since November 24th at Minnesota. Like uh, honestly, they, they had four road wins against bottom teams. They got crushed by the Embiidless Sixers gave up 143 points in Milwaukee and then blew a 22 point lead in Phoenix uh, against a full strength Phoenix team. They beat Phoenix, you know, with just Booker out there prior. So I'm just willing to take the dubs here to to put it make it back to back wins. Yeah, I mean, be be honest with me. Are you trying to retain some of the like dominance that the dubs had because of how much we could rely on them in times of, of betting, and you don't want that to go away, or do you no. really believe that this team still has enough in it? <clears throat> I I believe that this is a spot to ride for at least a game or two here, just based on the okay. massive rest advantage they have against other teams and, and continuity. And yes, there's still a bit of an emotional lift um, yeah. from, from that, the tribute last night. Agreed. Cause it's, cause it is still at home. If you want to yeah. look at that angle, um, which is partly to be honest with you, just to reveal even more behind the curtains of, of what we were talking about yesterday. I didn't really want to get on the bandwagon of like, yeah, this is probably a win because of an emotional game. And I just didn't even really want to touch that, you know? So we, we kind of stayed away from it. Yeah. it. It will carry over more than it, I think it'll dissipate tonight in this one at home again, because it's at, at home. I am not going to fight you on it because of how awful the Kings are on the road. There have been a number of times this season where you go, okay, well the dubs should dub here. They should be the dubs here and they don't. Um, but this is, I, I think the differences are, yes, Draymond is back, and that, say what you want, that seems to be a good thing at this point. He seems to be in a, in a better spot with the team, at least. And then Andrew Wiggins, like you said, that was the, the main thing that I was going to talk about as well, is like, 
the coma that he was in, yes. I mean, sleepwalking is is being kind because he was sort of just sleeping, honestly, still in bed. Uh, and and he's not necessarily like sprung out and become the dude he was in the playoffs where he was the second best player in the finals after Steph, like of any team he was. And then he and just fell back into his hole. Like, I'm not saying he's going to get all the way back there, but he, he's going to be better than he's been. And I would agree with that. And I, I would uh, consider his points prop at 12 and a half as well, which I am. Um, but for uh, my first bet, before I come back to talking about the dubs with you again at some point in this video, uh, or the next video, one anyway, uh, I'll talk about the Philly game where they're taking on the Pacers. And first of all, I'm not sure why they're only five and a half point favorites without Tyrese Halliburton in for the Pacers. Um, w- without Tyrese, mm-hmm. like everything is just different for this team. But I am going to focus in, on this bet, uh, at least on Philly over 121 and a half points. And I do think that this this game at five and a half, even four and a half, I think is still available in some spots like, I I think this is a good that's a really good bet for Philly because it's probably going to be a game around five to ten points for in Philly's favor for most of the game is what I would project. And then somewhere th- towards the end, there's just six free throws in the last minute and a half for Joel. Right. And then that, this game gets pulled away to about an eight, nine points. So I like that as well if you want to hit it. But the one twenty one and a half for this team is like they're, they're playing the Pacers. I know the pace is going to go down without Halliburton in. But the, the 76ers don't need pace. They didn't rely on, like, running up and down the floor with teams to score. They rely on Joel Embiid's sweet, sweet 15-foot jumper that is unguardable combined with his 11 free throw attempts, et cetera, right? Man's averaging 36 points a game. That's why his prop is at 36 and a half. And to be honest, he's gone over this in four of his last six versus this team because he just takes uh, Miles Turner and crumples him into a little ball and throws him away and then dunks it each time, right? So he's going to have that at his at, in his arsenal, the, the points in the paint, are always what you come back to when you when you're talking about why you want to fade Indiana. Um, the the uh, 76ers here, yeah, they're on the road and yeah, they they do score a ton in everywhere that they are. To be honest, it doesn't really matter. Um, but even on the road, they've gone over in six of their last ten, and the only unders were Orlando twice, Miami, Chicago, and then that weird uh, Charlotte game where they won by like nine points and slept walk through the entire thing uh, and won like 96 to 87. Tell me they were trying in that game. Um, but in this one, yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more trying. You've still got a team in the Pacers that's, you know, four games above 500. They're not necessarily breathing down the Sixers neck. But I mean, look, Joel, whether you want to say he's going for the MVP or not, because he needs to play almost all of the rest of his games. And that's kind of annoying and unfortunate. I would say he's still just going to make you regret uh, having that as your, your the, the cap this year, right, for being able to win the award of MVP. He's going to make people regret putting that 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 rule in because he's going to say, like, look at how much I'm scoring. And so I played 60, you know, four games and I can't win the MVP. So I expect him to like when he's in continue to go. I don't think there's any like let down for him or any reason that he would try harder in a different game versus this one. So with the way that their their offensive rating is up above 131 when they're playing this Pacers team over the last four games because Joel can go in, he can go out. Toby Harris is uh questionable uh, in this one and I'm not, I don't think he was at shoot around so it's not guaranteed that he's going to play. He's probably leaning towards doubtful. Uh and I still think that with Joel in there it's fine to to go over 121 and a half versus the Pacers. Yeah, I like this because, I, I mean, I was considering it because they, they lost in the in-season tournament last time they saw the Pacers. And, you know, what did we see? So other teams get their revenge after Halliburton just danced on them, basically, right? 132-126 win. He was just, like, strutting up and down the court, hitting threes. And then you come back and you get to face the Pacers without their engine. And, and so, yeah, it's probably a win for the Sixers, who, by the way, have covered an eight straight regular season games against the Pacers before that. Um, they, they're not, not necessarily counting that as a regular season game, but in this normal spot with the Pacers still trying to figure some stuff out without Hallie, um, yeah, I'll take it. And, you know, continue with the theme here, riding riding the wave, I'll take the Wolves again, who barely covered. Maybe you got a, you got an 11 there and you got backdoored at the last second from a bad beat three, but they covered 10 and a half last night in Washington, and now they're on a back-to-back in Brooklyn. I'll still take the minus four. Um, I just, you know, continuing to ride the wave of Chris Finch calling his team out and and Cat, you know, owning the fact that he cost them a game against the bottom feeding bar- Charlotte Hornets by by chasing a seventy point game. I mean, you, we we pretty much fixed it next time out against Washington. Instead of Ant having a fifteen percent usage rate, he had a forty five percent usage rate. Cat still got his, but you know, it's it's as the the, the number two option. It's like even if you're hot. This is still Ant's team, right? I mean, you got you got to flow through him. They were able to to clamp down like like we hoped. Um, you know, use that defense to get a win. 
And d- despite the fact that they shot just nine for 32 from three against a poor Wizards defense, they they just won the field goal attempt game, the possessions game, forced a bunch of turnovers. And when you look at, at Brooklyn, it's just like they don't do anything particularly well on offense. So as long as you can you can be disciplined and clamp down, you can pull away and win. Like they've been so bad down the stretch of games recently. I mean, some of them were on the road, like collapsing against the Clippers, but their last six home games in the second half, they have the worst defensive rating in the N- NBA, 131. They are negative 16.5 net. Uh, that's just in the second half. The Wolves last six road games in the second half, they have the fourth best defensive rating and they're plus seven and a half. Uh, so I, I think we could see a similar situation where even if they're not bringing it immediately on a back-to-back, uh, they can clamp down down the stretch and, and get this dub. I mean, the Nets have the 10th worst record against the spread as home dogs. They're 4-17-1 against the spread overall since December 11th. 4-12 and against the spread against the West. Superior Conference. The, the, the Wolves have a good 10-6 and record against the East. And they tend to just win as favorites. 26-7, and 12-3 and as road favorites. Average margin of victory is 8.5 points. Um, and yeah, I went through what they do after a loss. They've covered in four of their last five now. If, if you count that as a cover against Washington... And it's sort of, you know, a short travel spot. So just continue that. You know, let's continue to bounce back from our back-to-back losses and um, and what our coach said about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you on, on all that. Yeah, the, the I have nothing wrong with that because I also am just like, this is too small against this, this Brooklyn Nets team. So, uh, yeah, I, no love for the Nets and you won't hear me say anything. I'm just going to parlay the two bets we've been talking about uh, and, and put their money lines together for the Wolves and the Sixers, you still get plus 150 for both those teams to win because they're 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 both smaller spreads than they should be, to be honest. And and maybe we're we're missing something about you know the the rah rah nature, maybe the back to back. I don't think it'll really hurt the, the Timberwolves, who've only lost to two teams that are potentially as good as them. And one of them definitely better in the Celtics, right, on that back to back. And then the Suns, when they're at full strength, right? Yeah, that's not a fun team to deal with either. So. I, yeah, I, I hear everything you're saying on that, and I'm with it. So that's why I'm just going to put them together. For the the 76ers, like, I really talked about their scoring, but I also just left out a little bit of the Pacers' not ability to score, their lack of, of ability to do so without Tyrese Halliburton. I don't know, like, how you insert Pascal Siakam without Halliburton now and think that that's going to work very well. I'm, I'm truly nervous about that. Now, Nem- Nembar is going to come in and do fine as, as far as, like, running this offense, and really it's been TJ McConnell running this offense in the absence of Halliburton. It's it's wild to watch him play those like starter minutes uh, when, when Halliburton's out and, and he'll probably continue to do that in a good, good, t- obviously he knows the 76ers uh, pretty well from his days playing with them. But uh, at this point, like I, I, there's not much there. The, they score 115 points a game without him, which doesn't sound like that bad. It's better than a lot of other teams offenses, but it's not 127 points per game, which is what they rely on. Uh, when Halliburton's in the game, right? So that's that's a huge part of this is like, I, I see this game right around 123, 124 for Philly, 115 at the at max for, for the 76ers. I do think they'll hang with them. Maybe there's something with like the the, the Philly coming, or excuse me, the, the Pacers coming out strong in like the first quarter as like a stars out bets, you know, big, big time mm-hmm. energy up kind of thing for them. And then the Joel just comes back and is like, you don't have an answer for me. I would maybe consider points for him in the first quarter as well, as he's just the sort of stimmier of the uh, of when things go wrong. Or there's just like the other team surging. He's like, OK, well, I'm in a guaranteed bucket. So let me just go ahead and slow down this this momentum for you. And that's a big reason why, like them to be able to score, them to be able to just limit what the Pacers do. There's not going to be that that momentum for them. And then just on the other side for the for Minnesota, just to add to, a little bit to what you were saying. Um, yeah, I, I like the, the Minnesota on the on the road as uh, the favorite here. Like, still pretty good situation for them. Plus, like, if you're the the Nets and you're really relying on that ISO ball, this is not the defense to do that again with the individual defenders that they have and the fact that once you do get into the lane, you're not going to be able to just throw lobs to Nick Claxton. And that's a huge part of this is that like when they do get into the uh, get inside the three point line. If you're not Cam Thomas and you are actually looking for a potential pass, that has been there for Brooklyn because they have really versatile dudes who can come in from the three-point line and out and are really dangerous around the rim, even like a Cam Johnson who's there available for a lot. But not that's just not a play that you're going to get inside of five feet against this T-Wolves team. And if, if they're going to be relying on jump shots consistently, then that's not what I would feel good about for the Brooklyn Nets and uh, and I'll take the T-Wolves to win again. Yeah, Cam Johnson is questionable. I don't think I mentioned with, with the shoulder, right? I mean, that, if he's out, yeah, that's another 
weapon. I don't think we trust Mikel Bridges to follow up on his random spike game against a much better defensive team. Now, uh, I mean, the Sixers, yeah, I don't think you worry about that leg at all. They've won 16 of their last 18 with Joel Embiid. The most recent loss was against the new-look new Knicks, who just you know rolled them off the floor. They were just Weird. not ready for that. But, yeah. I mean, with Embiid out there, he, he is the MVP if he if he plays enough games. So, like, yeah, he's he's an unstoppable force, and he's crushed these Pacers, and it's a revenge spot. No worries about that. Uh, hopefully the Wolves bring it on a back-to-back. It's, it's much less travel than their last few back-to-back situations where they had to come home or fly out to L.A. or something, you know. This one, just just Washington to Brooklyn. You could almost take an Amtrak. They'll they'll be fine. They'll be ready to go. <laughs> Absolutely. That is all the time we have for you in Best Bets. Continue to follow along because we also have player props up for you as we do each and every weekday. So like and subscribe to that page. And until we see you next, happy betting. Don't be scared. Don't be scared.